This is the Krauss College, built 1889, we are told, uh, is now part of the Syracuse University campus, originally built as a women's college. Um, quite obviously looking like a castle. Still stands to this day. As we look at some of these modern day photographs, we get a real sense of the um, quality of building materials that were used in the process here which should lead us to looking into how long it took for them to build this at the time. Often we don't get that type of information from buildings from this era, but we are given a brief synopsis on the uh, Wikipedia page. And you can see here, we have a bit of a uh, um, rundown of how the construction process began with the cornerstone, June 1888, we are told, and then completion September 1889. So from the cornerstone laying, until completion, we're looking at just over a year, really, 15, 16 months. Um, we get the architect, Archimedes Russell. I think, let's take a closer look at him. And there's the man himself, Archimedes, interesting name. We'll take a closer look at that here shortly. We can see he's born in Andover, Massachusetts, dies in Syracuse, 1915. Of course, we don't have much visual evidence except for this picture. Um, that name Archimedes suggests that his parents must have known he would be born to some sort of greatness as far as mathematics go. Uh, he becomes this uh, architect that designs so many of the structures in the Syracuse area. We'll be looking at a few more in this uh, video. But uh, when we do a search for Archimedes, it is quite interesting because Archimedes, ma famous mathematician from BC um, over 2000 years ago, hailing from the ancient city of Syracuse in Sicily. Now, if that's not a coincidence, I don't know what is. So then I think you really have to ask the question, is it a, is it a coincidence? The whole Syracuse connection, the Archimedes, or is this a play on words, and uh, are we being fed historical fiction um, and being made to interpret it as fact? I leave that up to you, the viewer. You probably know where my suspicions lie. But on that note, let's take a closer look at Syracuse, New York. And I thank you for joining me for another Old World Exploration. Uh, we begin with a castle look. Now to the consciousness that was um, grafted onto us, castles are reserved for the hills of Europe, really. And not really something we've ever considered to be a part of, of North America. But as we see, uh, and as you do this type of research, you notice that uh, these types of structures existed. Uh, were plentiful in existence here in North America. Another interesting feature of the Old World are the theaters, the uh, entertainment facilities, many of them being overhauled to fit the, uh, the movie narrative of the 20th century. But uh, what I suggest uh, is we're looking at a culture in which, a previous culture, a previous humanity, in which the performing arts was a... Uh, a widespread and uh, highly appreciated aspect of uh, human culture. And I think when we, when we look at many of these structures, we are looking at um, the remains of that uh, aspect of our culture, much of which is falling by the wayside. And this gets right into even uh, musical instruments, um, the appreciation for, uh, for theater, performing, uh, yeah, the performing arts. So, so many opera houses in uh, in the American Midwest, West. very, uh, again, not fitting of the narrative that we've been told. We've been told that we were really scraping things together in the Industrial Revolution. Everything was dirty and, you know, children were working in factories. I'm not saying that wasn't happening. I'm saying that's a part of the inheritor's 
um, narrative, the new narrative, getting us on our feet for this new world that had had been set up for us. And then there was a previous humanity, much more uh, harmonious than what we have today. And Syracuse not disappointing whatsoever in this regard. Um, you saw the beginning of the video, the ridiculousness of the narrative. I think that we that we caught we caught them in a slip up as far as that goes. Um, I have uh, through my research into the old world found many anomalies, historical anomalies. At what point do we consider um, the anomalies more than just uh, happenstance? And that's sort of the question that I bring to the table. And uh, through organizations such as this and other similar organizations and getting right into the religious organizations, I think they were able to um, gain and maintain control of society and in so doing dictate, um, dictate our reality, dictate the terms of uh, how we operate with each other, um, how we exchange goods, all of those things. Hijacking, I like to call it. And when we look at many of these visual um, representations from the past, I think they do serve to help wake us up to the truth of our past. And we're searching for it. We're not claiming to have the truth. We're searching for a truth, something closer than what we have been, again, misled into. And part of that has to do with hidden technologies, um, what we call antiquitech at the tops of the buildings being a part of the harnessing of the ether um, of an energetic system we are unfamiliar with that has been fictionalized. Um, I think there was much more to our reality than we have been told. And you can see through the infrastructure here that the rail systems, which are supposedly introduced um, to be pulled by horses until electricity came about, which is an absolutely ridiculous aspect of our historical narrative. You can see how it's a part of the infrastructure, and it looks like it's been there for quite some time. And even the way that we build things like churches and uh, office buildings these days, compared to what we're seeing here, um, really beautiful the way that these are all put together. Very ornamental. Very nice to look at. That's, that's one of the reasons why I make these videos, because I want to share what I'm seeing. I want you, the viewer, to experience um, what I'm seeing with these visuals as well. And we are witnessing in our day and age um, the degradation of much of this old world in a lot of these uh, towns and cities that have uh, have petered off. Um, many of them have uh, fallen um, population-wise even, even according to the Wikipedia census. You have uh, Syracuse peaking in 1950 and petering off, petering, peaking at around 220,000 population modern day we're looking at 150 now I realize there are outlying surrounding areas but it still uh, speaks to the question of uh, these communities um, many of these buildings rotting away burning being torn down in the name of progress there was a massive push for um, the demolition of the old world in the 50s 60s 70s all throughout uh, North America, as far as I know, probably elsewhere as well. Of course, elsewhere we have the wars of the 20th century serving to destroy much of the old world architecture infrastructure. This is the Yates Castle, demolished in 1954, speaking of. You have to really try to rationalize why on earth you would demolish such a structure. Some views of the interior of that. front entry check out those doors always oh, the top hats train stations looking like castles built out of stone or a stone veneer on top of a red brick which is often the case all the old churches looking like 
again not like anything we would build in the modern day not even close we wouldn't even venture to attempt building in this manner in the modern day with these materials the uh, logistics of it is just it would be just too much to even consider but we are expected to believe that in the late 1800s and early 1900s this was just a typical method of construction um, even with the lack of access to the, well, the modern day technologies we have hydraulically powered um, vehicles modern day cranes things like that and of course there is a a real lack of uh, any sort of um, construction photos uh, and when we get them they all seem to be cookie cutter they all sort of look the same so it's there's no trust in the uh, historical narrative um, on this channel that we're it's all about being skeptical of what we're being told and what uh, you have been told um, and what we've all been told this is the church of the assumption really amazing looking something we would only have really have considered to have been in Europe but again these are all over North America as well spectacular looking structures And all it takes is a little bit of digging into a particular building, into a particular architect, into a particular story, and you find that either there is very little evidence or that the evidence doesn't align. In, very, very, in short order, you find holes in the narrative. But it does take the looking. If you don't want to know, you don't want to know. And that's up to you. Now this is the third um, Onondaga, probably maybe I butchered that, um, county courthouse, uh, built in 1857 we're told, um, was in use till 1907 and then this one was uh, put to use. You can see here this one um, designed by Archimedes, <laughs> Archimedes Russell, um, but this one was uh, torn down in 1968. And you have this amazing structure here again Archimedes from Syracuse not that Archimedes from Syracuse you get the picture beautiful structure amazing ornate built in three years at the turn of the 20th century hmm. An interesting photograph here as well you see all the people lined up on the top here very well built out, multi-storied structures everywhere here in Syracuse. Going way back, just like that photo I began the video with. Um, way back to 1850, you have four, five, six story buildings being constructed for a city of 20,000 people. Now, does simple logic dictate that as a possibility? Does it to me. And oftentimes in my research, you'll see buildings like this Empire House that has been decapitated. Where they're taking off the ornamentation and flattening the roof line. It seems to be a very common occurrence in this research. And the high schools, multi storied high schools with the towers, very common. Again, across the continent. Certainly not isolated to one location, to a particular architect. These things were everywhere. Do you know of any high schools being built these days with this type of ornamentation? And then we're not even sure what the building materials are, but none of this is uh, none of these building materials are fleeting. These things are built to stand the test of time. A wrecking ball would be required to knock them down, and in many cases that's what's gone on. Several hotels here by the same name on a oh same same hotel, sorry, different angle. A little bit of a view of the interior for you just so you can grasp the way they were building at the turn of the 20th century this was just a run of the mill just as all these technologies were getting on their feet and uh, the war world war one looming <laughs> we have uh, this type of architecture shooting up everywhere hotel syracuse another one of these amazing structures with uh, just very ornately decorated coffered ceilings, columns, capitals. Beautiful. Beautiful. The old world hotels are really something else. 
Let's take a closer look at this one. This is the Yates Hotel. No small feat in building this. And you can see here, uh, open to a reception of 4,000 people. Construction on this hotel, hotel took just over one year in 1891. <sighs> Six stories tall, occupying almost an entire city block and offering over 250 rooms. So that's just over a room a day. And it was called the most elegant hotel outside Manhattan. So how can you say this in the same breath? The most elegant hotel outside Manhattan, uh, while also only being built just over a year in 1891. We need to use logic. Very simple logic, folks. 80 years, closing in March of 71. And <laughs> a few months later, it was demolished. The site is now a parking lot. Case in point, folks. Just over a year. Hmm, what do you think? I smell it. <laughs> Hotel Manhattan. Here's a good uh, good look at the stone structure with the grout lines bulging between the rocks. It's not a look that we uh, really duplicate these days. Pretty amazing structure. Construction uh, methods there. This is the Landmark Theater. Just make it out here, the entrance. Take a look at the interior. And they say that plans to build this were announced February 19th, 1926. And it uh, opened for business February 18th, 1928. Almost exactly two years. Well, would you look at that? What do you think? And that's just the plans to announce. It doesn't even give us a construction time when they actually broke ground. So from the plan to build to the opening day is one day less than two years. Hmm. Okay. As uh, Dr. Evil would say, right. Two Carnegie Libraries. One wasn't good enough. They have the Syracuse University campus library. Oh, this is the MT Bank. Let's get to the exterior. You can find a great shot of the exterior in a nice black and white. Very interesting shape, though. The triangular indent there. Even in the foreground, you get a taste of the old world here with the old clock tower. But this is just a taste of the interior of the structure. So, all you finishers out there, check out that ceiling. It's a mind blower, has me. Beautiful. And when they when they used to build hospitals, they used to have a tower. Now they just chop it off nice and flat. Looking old, of course, at the time. All sorts of uh, vines growing on it. Now we have a what we call an Art Deco style building, the Niagara. The Niagara Mohawk building, built in 1932, just just 1932, we're told. Um, a few looks, closer looks here. This is the type of thing we get. In 1932, this is the Great Depression, right? This is just after the uh, stock market crash. Yet they were able to construct this, and this is something I come across a lot on my research as well. Is uh, these uh, Art Deco style buildings that were shooting up. In a very short period of time, um, often during the stock market crash, um, and often directly after the stock market crash. So there's definitely some sort of anomaly going on there, uh, worth exploring further. Of course, I do appreciate you joining me on this journey into the unknown as we ponder on what may have been. The Weeding Opera House. So, Syracuse getting its opera house. That's on top of the theaters we've already seen as well. Uh, 
And here we have a very comical aspect of the historical narrative. The Weeting Opera House was a performance hall, hosted operas, films, and other performances from 1852 to 1930. Initially built in 1852, it burnt down in 1856. But Weeting, John Weeting, rebuilt it that year, right after it burned down, and then eventually renovated the hall into an opera house. So one of those silly early narratives... Uh, we see this a lot in San Francisco. I just finished reading uh, John Levi's new book. Um, I definitely recommend you check it out. It's illustrating this same historical narrative going on in San Francisco at the time. And just before I move away from this, we see here more silliness. The Opera House broke down in 1881 and in 1896 and was rebuilt both times. The second time by his wife. Wasn't that nice? <laughs> and by 1930 it closed and was replaced by a parking garage. Are you swallowing this, folks? Come on. So they're telling us that this burnt down two, three times? Was rebuilt that many times? What an absurd tale. Absolute absurdity. Anyway, let's keep moving forward. See if we can find any more ridiculousness with the narrative. The post office. The savings bank. Let's do this one. And very little information readily available um, about this place, except for the fact that it had a passenger elevator built into it in 1876, and that it was located right off of the Erie Canal. 1876, but they were building with these type building materials. Very, very well built structures. And you have these nodes coming off the uh, roof ridge lines. Uh, and what many of us in this uh, in this old world research community have dubbed uh, part of the energetics of the system. And you can see it there. You see that often in a lot of old cath um, cathedrals as well. But in this case, we're getting it on the savings bank in Syracuse. Very beautifully detailed, and again, 1876. Here they say 1875. So one year discrepancy from Wikipedia. Hmm. We'll keep moving forward. We're getting there. We're getting close to the end of the file. Not a small file for uh, Syracuse. We have the state fairgrounds. Very interesting here. I, I wanted to find something a bit better for you of this location, but uh, this is the best I could do. Postcard form drawing. A manufacturer's building on the fairgrounds. You can see again, probably, possibly something that would um, house um, a, a dirigible type of vehicle, air travel type vehicle. This is the Alhambra. A quick look into the Alhambra tells us it was originally built in 1884 during a roller skating craze. Does that make any sense? Auditorium, great hall where lectures were happening, political meetings took place. Um, on December 20th, 1889, early morning, fire claimed the structure. Oh, would you look at that? And then they built it again, of course, just like the Opera House. <laughs> uh, damaged in a fire in 1947, the Alhambra was destroyed in a second fire in 1955. Three fires, count them, three. Uh, the site later succumbed to urban renewal. Well, what is it with all those fires? Here's a bit of footage of the fire. Structure still intact. And moving on, we have the Mitzpa. The Mitzpa. No, the Mitzpa, Mitzpa was the, the hotel portion of the structure. They say they uh, built in 1911, opened in 1915, from what I'm seeing. Uh, but just take a look at that. 1915, eh? Busy, busy little beavers at that time, weren't they? Putting up all sorts of castles across the country. There's the National Bank, one of many of these ornamental red brick structures with the sandstone. Beautiful. Alright, part of the University of Hendricks Chapel 
built again in that same stock market crash time period, 1929-1930. Oh, there's the dog again. And we have this type of structure going up again at the uh, end of the 20s. Certainly not anything we would really undertake in the modern day. Beautiful. The Natural History Building. No slouch. Even the entrance. Here's the stadium here. Once hailed as the greatest stadium stadium in the country. You can see how it's embedded into the, the ground itself. Uh, but this is the entrance part here that we were looking at. Um, a lot of these old stadiums, old world, I know uh, Lucius Aurelian did, uh, has done videos on stadiums. Definitely check that one out as well. I'll try to put that in the description. Worth a look. There's a lot more to this place, folks, than we have been told. It's a much more interesting place to be than we have been told. And that's why I really enjoy this research. Here's the campus. The Syracuse campus. Beautiful. There's, this is a great aerial shot of the stadium and the chapel we just looked at and a lot of the buildings and structures of Syracuse University. Very uh, prestigious university, popular Syracuse Orange. I believe they just changed from Orange Men to Orange, part of the PC culture of our lovely modern day progressive. Always so progressive. And again, I have I've posited in many of my videos that uh, the university is retaining many of the old world structures. Um, but I, again, I suggest they are inherited structures. Check out that library. Beautiful. It kind of doesn't look right too when you see the landscape and the buildings. It just feels like this look feels, looks and feels overgrown, mudded and overgrown. And again, of course, no shortage of uh, spectacular structures on the Syracuse campus. If you're from the area or live near the area, um, I'm sure it would be worth the boots on the ground to check out what Syracuse has to offer. And I'm sure most places, especially in this part of North America, have plenty to offer, offer in the way of the old world. And I encourage you to get out there and explore um, and do some boots on the ground investigating of your area. Syracuse. Along the Erie Canal, the impossible feat of engineering the marvel done in such a short period of time, used for such a short period of time, all but forgotten. Alright, I thank you for joining me on this investigation. Until next time.